good morning. Welcome to Decatur Baptist Church. Glad that you're here. Last Sunday of the year. We had a good year. You and your family had some good time the last recent weeks here to spend time with family, hopefully. Let's all stand, shall we? And we're going to sing number 66. If you would take a song, book, let's turn over there. Number 66, to God be the glory. Let's sing all three verses. Number 66. God be the glory, great things he has done, so lofty the world that he gave us his son, who yielded in his life and atonement for sin, and opened the lightning that only go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear him. again we'll turn to four uh, 543 if you would please 543 when the roll is called down sing all three verses number 543 when the trumpet of the lord shall sound the time shall be no one and the morning breaks into bright and fair when the sailors shall gather over on the other shore and the And the glory of the 
This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. The Lord of hosts hath purposed, who shall this know it? His hand is stretched out, who shall turn it back? Father, we look for the ultimate day when your purpose will be accomplished and fulfilled, and that every day, we know that your will is that you have last said. Pray that right here this morning that your will will be done and that we'll be open to the words of the Holy Spirit, the teaching of the lessons from the scripture, and that your will will be done in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated once again. Let's take our song books and turn to number 162, please. 162, the birthday of the king, both verses, 162. In the middle village of Bethlehem, there lay a child of the day, and the sky was bright with a holy light for the place where Jesus Hallelujah, oh how the angels sang Hallelujah, how they rang And the sky was bright with a holy light T'was the birthday of the King T'was a Thank you. 
Would you stand with me, please? A lot of truth in that. She did a good job. We're going to Ruth, if you would, please. Ruth chapter 1. We need to 12 verses here. As our custom, we'll do these verses responsibly. I'm going to start at verse 7. If you would, join me out one in every other verse as we read through verse 18. Ruth, seven, uh, Ruth 1, 7 through 18. <coughs> The Bible says, Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes, that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth, unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, steadfastly minded, steadfastly minded. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this year, which we've had. I think it's been a good year. I think we've accomplished some things. There's a lot much, much more to do. As I think uh, 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 um, it was Joshua who said, uh, there remaineth yet much land to be possessed. And we have a lot more to do. We have a lot of uh, goals to accomplish. And I pray that you would help with this sermon. That it would be a blessing to those that are in front of me. That we would be more conformed to the image of your son. That we grow spiritually and learn things and be challenged and Inspired in our faith and inspired in our desire to live a life that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. It's a fairly common theme this time of year to think about goals or to think about resolutions. Think about being resolved. That word is resolution. We, uh, that's the root word is being resolved. And so we're going to talk this morning about a determination or being steadfastly minded. And I think... Uh, when we talk about goals, the goal of the uh, the idea of the sermon this morning basically is uh, we talk about goals. We talk about something we want to accomplish for God. Uh, first off, we figure out that that's a good thing to do, or we figure out you know we have a goal that's worth pursuing, and then we understand it's going to take some determination to get there. If it's something that's worth doing, if it's something that's worth accomplishing for good and for God, then there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be difficulties along the way, and you're going to need to be steadfastly minded. You're going to need to be a determined person. I think this is a fairly familiar story that we read uh, this morning for most of us. Ruth, of course, was a Moabitess, and so she was a foreigner as far as Israel goes. And so she winds up hitting things off with a man of Israel who was there in her country as a foreigner, as a sojourner. And so these two were married, but then less than 10 years later, he passes away. And his father passes away. His brother passes away. All three of them, probably Elimelech first, but all three of them pass away. And so now as all three of these men are gone, their three widows 
are sitting there picking up the pieces of the tragedies and difficulties they've gone through. And they get word, they get news that there's now plenty of food in the land of Israel. And so Naomi sees no reason to stay in Moab where everything seems to be going terribly wrong. And she gathers her things and gets ready to head back to Israel and to live there. Well, she developed this relationship now with these two daughters-in-law. Both of them feel in some way that they, she's about, might be about the only family that they've got left. And so as she starts on her journey, they go along with her. And they start on this road. They get to the road to Judah, perhaps some sort of a, you know, a, a point of no return there. Okay, this is the road to Judah. It doesn't lead to anything else but Israel, right? And they, they turn around and Naomi looks at them and she says, boy, I'd, I'd love to have you both with me on this journey. We've gotten so close. You're all I have. But ladies, we need to be realistic. You need a place to live where you've got a husband to take care of you. If you come with me, well, I'm certainly not going to have any more sons that you're going to wind up marrying. So why don't you just stay here in your own land where you know all the customs, you're familiar with everything, and it's more likely you're going to have a lot in common with the men here to try to build a new life for yourselves. And at first, both of them say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to stay with you. We want to be with you. We want to come along. But after a little more persuasion, Orpah concurs. And Orpah decides to head back to her people and to her culture. But we saw in the passage, Ruth was absolutely and completely determined. Didn't matter what Naomi said to Ruth. She has set her face like a flint. She set her face like an adamant stone. She is determined. She's going to stay with Naomi and with the God of Israel. Now, we aren't told really why Ruth became so determined, really why Ruth came to see that the Lord was the true God, that Jehovah God was, was the right God, and everybody else, you know, was some sort of a false God of some kind. Uh, but she seems like she comes to realize that, that she probably became a very attached to knowing Naomi as well. And so here we see our first example of today of somebody in the Bible who became very determined in some very good goal or endeavor or something that they long to accomplish for the Lord. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Being determined, being steadfast and minded in some kind of good endeavor or goal. Now notice the way things played out for Ruth over the course of the next few chapters. After she became determined to follow the Lord with all of her heart, she was still fairly poor for a little while. There were still a lot of difficulties that she had to go through. There was a lot of work to be done. It was not very glamorous work. So her determination and her steadfastness were tested over the next few chapters. But she stood firm, and we see in the end that her end was blessed. As we go through these examples this morning, we'll see that a lot. A lot of the times accomplishing extraordinary things for God requires determination. Because again, there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be obstacles. Accomplishing goals and tasks that are worth going after and working toward. You know, Christians shouldn't be wishy-washy people. We need to be people who get some determination to accomplish something with the little time that we have here on this earth and that God gives us to accomplish and that we need to stay faithful to the Lord. Can we flip over to Psalm 17, please? Psalm 17. We'll go there next in just a bit. The songwriter said, I am resolved no longer to linger charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord in my sight. As Christians, we need to get resolved. Resolved to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Resolved to be faithful to sharing the gospel with others. Resolved to stay faithful to God's house. Resolved to be righteous and godly and faithful spouse. Let's get determined this morning. Let's get resolved. Let's get steadfastly minded. That's one of the reasons I believe God blessed the latter end of Ruth and allowed her to have some things that money can't buy. We still talk about her and the fact that she was in the line of the Messiah, that scarlet thread that goes throughout the Old Testament. Why? I think one reason was because she became steadfastly minded to do something right, to have the right God in her life and to stay faithful to him. She said, hey, no matter what it takes, I'm going to be with you, Naomi. I'm going to stay faithful to the God of Israel. So our main points today are just, just examples of people in the Bible and, and something that they got determined about, something they got steadfastly minded about. To do what was right before the Lord. So number one was Ruth there. Look in Psalm 17 if you would. And look at verse number three. Psalm 17, three. Thou hast proved my heart. Proved means to test, right? Thou hast tested my heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. So number two is David. David is somebody who became determined about several things in his life. And as an example of somebody who was filled with the Spirit, specifically he purposed, he determined that he was going to keep his mouth right 
as far as the Lord is concerned. Also, we see the same thing in Psalm 39. David said there, I said I will keep take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. You know what the Apostle James tells us in his epistle? He says that making sure that our mouth, with our mouth we do not transgress, is no mean feat. James said, if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Perfect there is in the sense of maturity. So he says, look, it's the toughest thing to get under control. It's this tongue right here. He says, look, if you get to the point where consistently you're righteous in your speech, you're, control, you're in control of that mouth, and perhaps there's actually wisdom and understanding coming from it. Well, that means that you're a mature person. You shouldn't have trouble with virtually any other part of your body at that point. That I, I just can't control this other thing. And bringing the captivity to the spirit and to the obedience of Christ. He says, look, guard that tongue. Control that tongue. And that can steer your mind in the right direction and your spirit in the right direction. So we see that this behooves us to determine with David that we will not transgress with our mouth. That's a good thing to determine for the new year. We, we need to speak with honesty. We're going to speak with kindness. We're going to observe the golden rule with our speech. We're going to obey the commands of the Lord. And if you can get consistent in doing that, James says, hey, you'll be steering your vessel the right way toward righteousness. And a lot of the other things that, that draw people back and cause people to have problems, uh, a lot of those things won't even be an issue for us. David was a good example of that. The book of Psalm 34, if you would, please. Psalm 34, we'll look there next. While you're turning there, I'll read for you another psalm. Uh, in that psalm, the songwriter says, Thou art fairer than the children of men, if grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. And that's probably talking about the Messiah, but still a great reminder to keep our speech honorable and upright, and that if we do that, the Lord will bless us as a result. Psalm 34, if you look there at verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall, be, shall continually be in my mouth. Not only does David determine that he won't transgress with his tongue, here he also says, you know the thing I'm going to do with my mouth? I'm going to make sure that I bless the Lord and that I praise the Lord on a regular basis. We see this over and over in the book of Psalms, Psalm 68, 5. He's, the psalmist says, my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. In Psalm 71 and verse 15, my mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. In Psalm 81, the psalmist says, I will make known with my mouth thy faithfulness to all generations. In Psalm uh, 109 and verse 30, he says, I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yea, I will praise him among the multitude. In Psalm 145 and verse 21, he says, my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name. Forever and ever, over and over and over, David says, and the other psalmists say, look, I'm going to use the mouth that God gave me and the influence that God gave me and the pen that God gave me to praise the Lord. That's something that we should all be doing as Christians. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you praise God? Do you regularly, do you talk about his goodness and, and his grace and his greatness? Is that something that happens often or continually or on a regular basis? If not, that's an area where you can get more consistent. That's something you can work on for the Lord. We should constantly be praising the Lord. But again, decisions like that will take determination, my friend. You need to get to a point where we're steadfastly minded. That's the example that we see here of David. Because again, other priorities will creep up. Distractions and obstacles will come around. They don't always seem like there's something else that we should be talking about. But look, we just need to get determined like David. Hey, I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to let my coworkers at work. I'm going to let other people find out that I think the world of my God. There's something else that David said about his mouth. Psalm 49 and verse 3 says, My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be understanding. David said, you know, with my inner dialogue, I'm not going to allow a lot of foolishness and, and nonsense and waste of time and sinfulness in there. I'm going to make sure that I talk about wisdom and understanding. You know, let me tell you something, my friend. Our culture today is fraught with foolishness. It's filled with it. If you don't believe me, just go to a public computer at the library or someplace and, and go to the home page of YouTube, you know, a place where you're not signed in. Just look up what's the most popular videos. Those will be suggested for you if you're not signed in, right? You're not going to find anything for instruction and, and learning and for wisdom and understanding. No, no. You're, the, the videos that are going to pop up for you are, are going to be the, the Taylor Swift, you know, and the, the videos that are fluff and filler and nonsense or things that have filth in them. Videos that do nothing for your IQ. They just help you stay dumb so that you're easy to manipulate. Some of those videos have millions of views, my friend. And David says, look, I haven't got time for nonsense today. I need wisdom. I desire wisdom. I've got to have understanding. 
My constituents need for me to be pursuing wisdom. My family needs for me to get understanding. And look, that's not just for monarchs. That's for all of us. Look for wisdom. Seek after it. Don't just allow your flesh to look for entertainment and waste of time. It'd be a good thing to, to have a New Year's resolution about wisdom, learning videos, instead of just the videos and the other programs where you know you sort of let your brain go into autopilot slash to do nothing mode, right? Look for places and opportunities to learn wisdom, books. Figure out the book you're going to read, the book based upon the fact that it's got some wisdom in it that you can learn to be more of a blessing to others or be conformed to the image of the Son of God. You know, I think most of us know this, but there are so many learning apps. You can learn a new language in your spare time for free. There's apps like Language Transfer or Duolingo. I believe that one's free or there's a free option on it. You can learn about history. You can learn for free about chemistry and biology. Let's do like David here and take control of that inner dialogue and learn things. Be people, the Bible says that a wise man will, will increase learning. No foolishness, no nonsense. Life's just too short for all that. Let's find some wisdom and let's find some understanding. If you want to go over to uh, 2 Chronicles, please, now. 2 Chronicles chapter 2. 2 Chronicles 2. So three things David determined about his speech that we noticed in his mouth. He says, look, I'm not going to transgress with my mouth. No sinfulness. And then he says, I'm going to praise the Lord with my mouth. And then he says, look, I'm only going to allow wisdom and understanding to come through my mouth. These are all good things to, de to determine and to strive toward. Again, James says, look, if you can get control over that tongue, and again, that might, might include that last one that we looked at, where you got a tongue that has some wisdom and some understanding that spills out of it. If, if you can get that control over that tongue, he says, you can live a life that's free of, of a lot of the appetites and lust and other things that trip people up and cause them to fall and not reach their potential for God. So we looked at Ruth in an example of Somebody who made the Lord her God and became determined to keep it that way. We looked at David who got determined to keep his mouth right. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to keep it just wisdom and honor and, and not transgress with my lips. Now if you want to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 2, and we'll start reading in verse 1. And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. So this was pretty simple. Solomon determined there, it says it's the, third, the third word, determination, that he would build a house for the Lord, a beautiful temple that the people could come to when they want to worship God. This temple took over seven years to build. It was very expensive with all the cedar and all the gold and the fine workmanship. But Solomon determined that whatever it's going to cost him, whatever sacrifice required, he was going to see this project through to completion. That's a good example for us in our lives. Sometimes we need to get a vision for something we want to accomplish for the Lord and for his work. And get determined that we're going to see it through to completion. Not give up and not be satisfied with second best. Not be satisfied until the job is done. William Carey said, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. In Malachi, you know, God challenges his people to put him to the test. You ever wonder just how big of miracles God could do? If he had some people who got determined and said, you know what, we're not going to let God go until we figure out what kind of a great miracle God is capable of. We've got a big God. In the Bible, we see amazing things. Joshua asked God to stop the earth from rotating for a while. You know what? He did it. Moses lifted up his rod and God parted the mighty Red Sea. David trusted God and defeated a huge giant in Goliath. What are some things that you're going to attempt for God in 2024? Solomon determined to build that house. In a few years, it was done. We need to get determined for something we're going to do. It's great. Something great for God. Next, we want to flip over to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. It's a fairly known, a fairly well-known children's story that I thought of this week that I was thinking about these kind of thoughts. It's called The Little Engine That Could. In this fake world, the train engines, of course, are alive, and apparently they go through some sort of a growth process. You know, they start as baby engines and get to be kid engines, and, and then they get bigger and stronger. Eventually, they're an adult engine, and they're fully strong, right? Well, the little children of a certain town were waiting for their toys or some other super important delivery like that. And so in this story, the big engine broke down. So they called on a little young engine, and they hooked him up to this heavy load. He looked ahead of him, and there was a huge mountain in front of him. And part of him thought, you know, that this load might be too much for me. But he decided to think positively. He controlled his mind. He said, look, mind over matter. He said, I'm just going to keep telling myself that I think I can. Can I get up that steep mountain? Well, I think I can. 
So he got up all the speed that he could muster, and he kept on telling himself, I think I can, I think I can, all the way up that mountain. And thinking that he could caused him to keep on trying his hardest, even after he got tired, even after most of his fuel had been spent. He just kept on giving 110%. And of course, according to the author, that little engine made it over that steep mountain, not because he was a big enough engine, but because he kept on saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. You know, I don't like words like I can't to be uttered in our home. I don't believe I, I don't believe in I can't. I believe in let's find a way. I believe in, well, maybe the first method that popped into my mind didn't work out so well. Well, let's come up with a different plan. Let's figure out another way. Let's think we can. And a whole lot of the time, we're going to find that, we, that we'll end up realizing our true potential. The more often you follow that idea, the more you experience accomplishing things that were a bit difficult and the more confident you become. Determination can help you reach your, pure, your true potential. Now think about this church. Our church has a lot of uh, a lot of strength. Our church has a nice facility. There are all sorts of people in this area. Our, as far as our congregation goes, we have an involved congregation. We have caring people in our congregation. We have intelligent people in our congregation. We have hardworking people in our congregation. We can find ways to grow and reach this area for Christ. We just need to get determined. We just need to get steadfastly minded. Let's keep on saying, I think we can. I think we can find people. I think we can reach a neighbor. I think we can reach a visitor. I think we can bring a couple visitors each week or each month. Let's find a way. Let's get steadfastly minded that we're going to do all we can to reach this area for Christ. Look at 2 Kings there in chapter 2. 2 Kings 2 verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Elisha, of course, his servant. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry, here I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold you your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold to your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. Determination. If you know the story, the way it played out here, that his determination here of Elisha caused him to have his prayer answered. And he asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. And the Lord used Elisha in a great way as a prophet for his glory. Elisha did not allow himself to be sidetracked. Elisha did not allow himself to be distracted. Elisha did not allow himself to be thwarted. Elisha got his eye on a prayer that he wanted answered. And he said, I will not leave the side of this man of God until I get that prayer answered to the glory of God. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, God's just looking for some people who will pray with importunity. They'll keep on coming back and they'll keep on praying. And they'll come and ask again. And they'll ask again. And they'll ask again. And they'll ask again. The Bible says that he's going to answer that prayer. Just keep on praying and keep on asking again. And then pray again. And then pray again. You know what Jesus said? Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. If you keep on asking with the consistency that the Lord is waiting for. There's a song that says, just keep on praying until light breaks through. The Lord will answer. He'll answer you. God keeps his promise. His word is true. Just keep on praying until light breaks through. Elisha is a good example of somebody who got determined that he would have that which he sought. Of the Lord. Next, let's look at Daniel, if you would please. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. We looked at Ruth today. Ruth was a good example of somebody who determined to make her Lord her God, make the Lord her God, and to keep her heart that way. And God blessed her for that. We looked at David as an example of somebody who's, who was determined to keep his mouth pleasing to the Lord. And God blessed him for that determination. We looked at Solomon as a good example of somebody who got a vision and a goal for something he wanted to accomplish for the Lord. And he saw it through to completion. And God blessed him for that. And he was able to help the people of, of the land to have a great place to go and worship the Lord and have a great testimony for God in that way. We looked at Elisha as an example of somebody who got determined to see a certain prayer answered and was relentless in his prayer and it couldn't be thwarted. Eventually, he got what he asked for from the Lord and God blessed him. Daniel chapter 1, we looked at this last week, actually. Daniel was taken from his home and his family and all the customs and such that were familiar to him. 
given a certain way that he had to go, a certain career, you know, didn't have choices to make on those fronts. But he had obeyed the commandments of the Lord in the Old Testament, the Bible says, not to eat the food offered to idols and not to eat certain meats and types of foods that were prohibited in the Old Testament law. Let's look at it, Daniel chapter 1 and verse 5. The Bible says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that the end thereof they might stand before the king. And of course, the insinuation is you're in a foreign land, you're, you got a king that's a heathen king, doesn't know about the laws and the customs of kosher meat and the other things for the Jews and Israelites, that, that there's no way he's going to be keeping all of that, right? And so verse 6 says, Now among these were of the children of Judah, Dan and Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and look verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Notice the word in here. Daniel, in his mind and in his heart, purposed that he will not defile himself. He said, look, all my life I kept these laws. I've never defiled myself in this way. And he was determined to keep it that way. No matter what. Hey, if they punish me, if they force me, I don't care. I'm not eating that food and I'm not drinking that wine. But then let's finish the verse. Notice what it says. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Look, Daniel was determined. He was steadfastly minded. I'm not going to defile myself no matter what. But he was also wise enough not to just barge right in to his superior and say, listen, Buster, you ain't going to be the boss of me. I serve Jehovah God, and he's commanded me not to eat this well. And if you can't make me eat it, I'm not going to do it. So help me, you'll have to shove it down my cold, dead throat. His superior, if he had said that, might have said, well, that could be arranged. And you might have made an example out of him. Daniel had some wisdom in his day. He was not going to eat it no matter what. The Bible says he was determined. But he began by requesting an exemption and trying to work with his superior, saying, listen, let's see if we can come together here. Maybe we can find a place where, you know, I don't have to compromise my convictions, but where you're still able to fill all your responsibilities and you're still looked at as doing a good job for your superior. Can we find something like that? And his superior was hesitant. You read the story. But eventually they found a solution. They found some common ground where Daniel did not defile himself. But his superior was eventually praised for a job well done. Diplomacy. Wisdom. I can work with my superior. I can work with my fellow employees. At the end of the day, Daniel was the best student and the best employee, if you want to call it that. Maybe he was the best worker, right? Daniel was the best student and the best worker that this guy had, had in his class by far. And that allowed his superior to work with him because he was such a great worker and such a great student. And Daniel became a great example of being a subordinate that shows he is submissive, he shows he's willing to obey completely, and that he has the best interest at heart of the superior. And therefore, his consideration gets, you know, he gets consideration for his requests and for the things that he asked for. Very wise young man, it's a good example. I hasten to look at the, the New Testament now, Acts chapter 20, if you would. Acts chapter 20, we're doing final time. Acts chapter 20. We're talking about determination this morning. Is there something that God would like to accomplish through you and the talents and abilities that he's given you, the experience he's given you throughout your life? In 2024, you can start or you can get something big accomplished. Getting a vision for something that the Lord could do through your faithfulness and, and your expertise and your adherence to biblical principle and your wisdom. Realizing that a lot of things do take years, if not decades, but being determined anyway to see it through to completion. Making decisions for God. Getting yourself steadfast in mind to do something that's worth doing for the Lord. Let me ask you a question. If time and money weren't a factor, and if your perceived limitations weren't hindering you, what would you attempt for God? If there's anything taught throughout all the Bible, it's the fact that there's no limit to God to accomplish his will by many or by few, by weak people or by strong people, by wealthy people or by poor people. Obstacles and weaknesses just mean that God's going to get more glory. Acts chapter 1, look there at verse number one. Uh, Acts chapter 20, look at verse number 1. Acts 20, verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed, for he looked into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them unto exhortation, he came into Greece. And there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, he was about, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. You know, we can turn to a number of different passages talking about the determination of Paul, even to the point of misguidedness on one occasion. Paul had obstacles. Paul had resistance on virtually a day-to-day -day basis many times throughout his ministry. Yet what do we see? We read about amazing feats, amazing opportunities to build churches, amazing results. One result, it talks about 
um, how in Ephesus, as it started in chapter 19 there, that Paul separated some disciples and he set up a system. He created this system where in about two years, all they that dwelt in Asia heard of the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Thousands and thousands of people. There's incredible feats by a man who said, you know, I labored more abundantly than all the apostles. He was a man of determination. As the writer of Hebrews very often put it, what shall we more say this morning? The time would fail to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, we talked about a little bit, Samuel, and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness, remained strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had cru trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yet moreover of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Sounds to me like some people of determination. They didn't care what went wrong. They didn't care what obstacle they ran into. They said, I've got a job I can accomplish for God. I can bring glory to him. And those are feats of great courage and grit and the people of steadfast minds. What about you this morning? You want to just settle for the average life? The type of answers to prayer that we're all, we all sort of expect. The type of accomplishments that don't really require too much determination or dedication. That dedication to stick to no matter what. I say we get some determination. I say we see just what God can do with some people who say, you know, I'm going to be steadfastly minded to read my Bible this year. I'm going to be steadfastly minded that my prayer life is going to grow. I'm going to be steadfastly minded that my missions giving is going to grow. I'm going to be steadfastly minded that I'm going to be more and more involved in my church. I'm going to be steadfastly minded that God and I are going to accomplish something great for him. It's all going to be through his power, of course, and he gets all the glory. But sometimes he needs people like David and Daniel and Ruth to have some determination about them. Let's be like these examples. Let's be like Ruth. Let's keep on the Lord, having the Lord as our God. Let's be like David. Let's keep our mouth pure. Let's keep our mouth right before God. Let's keep a word of testimony and praise to our God uh, continually on our minds. Let's continue to have wisdom and understanding that we find and develop from somewhere, that we learn, and that we grow, that we mature spiritually, and then we can be a blessing to those around us. Let's be like David and saying, you know what? Goliath sure is big. I get that. But hey, he said some things that God doesn't appreciate. I bet you he can be beat. He, you say he's too, big to, he's too big to hit. No, he's too big to miss. Let's find some determination for God. Solomon, Elisha, Daniel, let's be like these people. Let's be like Paul. Let's find a cause that's bigger than ourselves. Maybe it looks impossible. Maybe it does take years or decades. Maybe it's much bigger than we think is possible. But let's get some determination about us. Let's see what God can do if he's had some people who we can steadfastly be minded for good and for God. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the example of, of Ruth. She got steadfastly minded. Thank you for the example of David. Thank you for the example of Daniel. Thank you for the example of Elisha. Thank you for the example of Solomon. Thank you for the example of Paul and Peter. We had more time with Peter, chapter, Acts chapter 10. And these people who showed us that, hey, when you say, you know what, I'm going to... Yeah, sure, there's going to be obstacles. Sure, it's going to be tough. Sure, it's going to be a lot of work. Sure, it's going to be a lot of effort. Sure, I'm going to have to labor more abundantly than all the apostles. I don't know if I can do that right now, but I, I can do it today. I don't know if I can do that for the next six months or years, but I can do it today, and I'm going to get determined. I'm going to get steadfastly minded that God and I can accomplish something through the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, through the principles of the Word of God, through prayer. I can do something big for God. Lord, help the people that are here before me this morning. I pray that you just, just point out something in their life, something that can be accomplished, something they can do, that, that missionary that needs to be supported, those, the, the, just the, the different things that you know and that they know that we're talking about and we're thinking about. Lead their heart, lead their mind to something. Later on today, they can sit down and say, hmm, what's a plan? What's a goal? What's a strategy? What is something that, yeah, be, it, it looks a little bit tougher, than what I can do in my own strength. Because we're not just working in our own strength. We've got Jesus Christ. We've got the Bible. We've got the gospel. We've got the power of Christ. We've got the power of the resurrection. Help us, Lord, to tap into these powers. Lord, help us, Lord, to get some determination. 
and be steadfastly minded people for the glory of God. Lord, thank you for today. I pray that this would be a blessing to all the people that are here. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stand if you would, please. Let's all stand. I'm going to turn to number 376. 376 in your songbooks. 376. It's called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. 376. We're going to sing three verses here. I'm going to sing. And you can come if you like to. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, no world behind me, the cross before me, no world behind me, the cross before me, no world behind me, the cross before me. Nobody's going to go with you. But we need to get determined for Christ to do something for the Lord. All right, a couple quick announcements to remind everybody of. Tonight, uh, of course, is the last day of the year. We have a young people's activity we're going to have right after the evening service. And uh, so, for these young people, we'll let you get a determination on that. If you're young at heart, you're welcome. Amen. All right, January the 6th, Men's Prayer Breakfast. That's the first Saturday of the month, next month. And so 8.30 a.m., we're going to meet in Fellowship Hall, have breakfast, have some fellowship, and uh, have a time of prayer for our church and for our new year. And uh, then, of course, visitation, church-wide visitation, comes right after that about 10 a.m. And then uh, Lord's Supper will be observed in the evening service on January the 7th. That's the first Sunday of the month there, or Sunday of the quarter. January the 8th, uh, we're planning on taking down the Christmas Day court. I asked my wife about that, and she said, well, January the 6th is, is Amish Christmas, isn't it? No, she didn't say that. But uh, we'll, we'll keep it up until, uh, until the 7th, right? And uh, so then the 9th, uh, ladies have a fellowship. Ladies' fellowship, 6 p.m. And uh, so there'll be food there. Come and enjoy some time of fellowship for the ladies. All right, I think that's what I've got. Let's all stand, shall we? We're doing good with our uh, prize offerings and missions giving. It's, uh, it's going to be maybe about two weeks here. We'll have a business meeting. We'll put everything out in front of everybody and uh, print all of that out. And uh, so that's in the works. But I'll make an announcement maybe about that tonight or next week. And uh, things are going well. We're doing okay. And uh, God's been good. Let's have Brother Perry. If you would, please. Uh, pray he's going to pray his word this morning. Dear Lord, again, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the many examples of Scripture, Lord, where even during difficult and somewhat almost impossible times, Lord, again, and women alike stayed steadfast in their uh, convictions and their, uh, uh, their, their work that you've given 